Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your servants. We thank you for our brothers, our sisters, fathers and mothers in the Lord. We thank you for all the workers, all the leaders who are congregated here today. Thank you for all our leaders, men and women, in all the location where we're gathered together now. We're asking, Lord, that you impact every life tremendously, abundantly, purposefully tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Strengthen the weak. Amen. Lift up the fallen. Amen. Encourage your people. Amen. Help us, Lord, to move on in the strength and the power of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. You have called us. You will equip us. We will not fail. None of your servants will fail in Jesus' name. Teach us tonight again. Train us tonight again. Equip us to send us forth to do greater service for the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. God bless you. We're reading from Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, I'm reading verse 18 and verse 19. Here are the words of Jesus Christ. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and i will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven i thought somebody there will say amen, amen. and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven I'm sure you've heard those verses before. But today, the Lord wants to speak to every one of us directly concerning building the church in the new dispensation. As we have emphasized over and over, we know that it's a new day. It's a new dispensation and a new dawn is coming in the life of everyone in your life it will be new in your family it will be new in your ministry it will be new in your local church it will be new you're going to begin to minister with new power new unction new anointing new breakthrough and you're going to have great great results in jesus name Amen. the lord jesus said i will build my church but we know that he's not here in the physical because he has messengers and he has ministers that he has appointed and he has members too members of the body of christ that will build the church and as we think about building the church in the new dispensation, there are many churches that are building, many denominations that are building. But you see, there are some churches and there are some ministers that feel that if we're going to build and it's going to be fast and it's going to be broad, they think that reaching the world calls us to kind of compromise with the world. They feel if you go through the Bible and you stand on the word of God, that you cannot build a large church, a growing church, a prosperous church, and you cannot build a church that is viable and living. Therefore, they have the idea that they are to compromise with the world. Other people feel they are to conform with the world. They're building the church and they want to get the world into the church and they want to conform with the world. Other people just feel we need to cooperate. 
these people in the world are there and they have the minds of the people of the world and if we're going to reach them and bring them in we must cooperate with the world but you know the church the minister the members the people that go to the world and they condescend to the world down to the level of the world as they say they are building the church eventually they will collapse for the world and they'll be condemned for the world the lord has called us to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature and as he sends us out we convict the world we confront the world we compel the world we convert the world we confirm the word the word of god as we go out we go out in the strength of the lord in the power of the lord and we confront them and we confirm the word by the power of the spirit in fact as the church marches out we conquer the world and that's what the lord has called us to and as you look at what he calls us to number one converting the worldly the people they have their mind their brain their practice their principle everything is of the world and we go out there we want to call them out of the world and we want to call them to christ and so we convert the worldly number two we convict the wicked there's a lot of wickedness all over the world that's why they're called sinners and if we're going to get them out of their sin and come to the savior they have to come under conviction the conviction of the spirit of god we convict the wicked we confront the way watch you cannot win souls to the lord if you are dodging issues if you will not confront the people that are wicked and wayward and evil and devilish and demonic and so the lord is calling us that as we join hands with the almighty join hands with christ we go to confront the wayward we compel the wanderers the people who are just roaming about under the bridge on the street in the communities in a neighborhood and the lord has sent us and he says compel them to come in with a convincing kind of communication communicating the gospel telling them that jesus christ has died for them that jesus christ is the son of god and he's the savior and by the communication of the powerful gospel the irresistible gospel you compel the wanderers to come in not only that we conquer the world the world will not conquer you their corruption will not conquer you and the compromises of the world will not conquer you but you go out there and you go in the strength of the lord you go in the power of the lord and you are going out there to conquer the world but you know as we go there we don't go empty-handed we have what it takes everything they need we can give unto them through jesus christ give me a good amen, amen. they are sick you will heal them they are oppressed you will deliver them they are poor you'll prosper them they are weak you will strengthen them we have the word we have the anointing and we have everything it takes to go out to the people there and meet the needs of the people and so we confirm the lord confirms the word and as we go there remember we contend also against the people of the world without wavering we contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints and there is no wavering 
and there is no dilly in and it is not like we're not sure of what we're saying we're so sure that anything that comes from the contrary side by the grace of god you will stand firm i said you will stand firm i will confirm the word and content for the faith once delivered unto the saints look at first john chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 15 first john chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 15 it says in verse 15 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world passeth away and the loss thereof but he that doeth the will of god abideth forever it tells us very clearly then as the lord has raised us up to go out to go forth to reach out to touch the lives of people and bring them into the kingdom we are not to cooperate with the world we're not to conform to the world we're not to compromise with the world but we're to go forth and see to the conversion of the people in the world and the spirit of god that abides within us will give us the effectiveness and the power to get that done in jesus name in acts of the apostles chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 19 acts chapter 3 verse 19 it tells us what is to happen as we reach forth and reach out when the gospel repent ye therefore here is the preacher like you and i here is the apostle that the lord addressed up here is peter telling the people you know before the holy ghost came upon him it was like cowering it was like afraid it was like he was dodging the issue he couldn't confront the people but now the holy ghost had come a new dawn a new dispensation came upon him and it was there on the day of pentecost and that power of god came upon him like the power is going to come upon you tonight and that power will move you and that power will drive you and that power will compel you that power will propel you and you're going to do it like peter in jesus name repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord that's what you have to tell them you tell them they are to be converted conversion will come in john chapter 16 reading here from verse 7 john chapter 16 verse 7 nevertheless i tell you the truth it is expedient for you that i go away for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. That's the Holy Spirit. I was talking about the immersion in the Holy Ghost. The baptism in the Holy Ghost. And then it says, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment thank god the time has come and then you know we said according to the word of god we confront the world and the people in the world will know that they've seen preachers before when they see you they're going to see a different kind of preacher i said when they see you my brother my sister they're going to see a different kind of preacher look at their testimony in acts chapter 17 verse 6 acts chapter 17 verse 6 he said and when they found them not they drew jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city saying these that have turned the world upside down 
are come hither also. Uh, you know that these are not backbench preachers. These were not dodging preachers. These were people that went to the world and they confronted the people of the world and you must do that. You must do that and you are going to conquer. And that is how you are going to bring them in, bring them to the gospel. You're not going to allow people to say, well, we'll consider it another time. We'll think about that by your courage, by your communication, and by your impartation, you will compel them to come in into the kingdom in Jesus' name. The sinners you confront and the sinners you preach to, they will not sleep out of your hand. They will be converted. Look at Luke chapter 14, and I'm reading from verse 23. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and edges and compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. The days are gone when you as a preacher will be apologetic. Would you want to receive Jesus as your personal savior? What if he says no? Would you want to repent? What if he says no? Do you want to come into the kingdom of God? What if he says no? The Lord said, you have the message. You have the key. And you'll find the key tonight. If you've not got the key yet, you are taking the key away from here tonight. And since you have the key, it's not like, you know, will you want to be born again? It says, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. The Lord will use you. Mark chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 20. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went forth. Somebody there today will go forth. I will go forth. What are you? I will go forth. You'll go forth in Jesus' name. And it says, and they went forth and preached where? And preached, I said, where? Everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. In Jude, I mean, only chapter verse 3. Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, common to everyone, the Jew and the Gentile, available for everyone, it says it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You see the calling he has given us? Honestly contained for the faith once delivered unto the saints. We're going out to the world to convert them. We're reaching out to the world to convict them. And we're reaching out and moving on to confront them and to compel them and to conquer the world and to confirm the world with signs following and to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. All that we do in the process, in the plan of building the church in this new dispensation. Building the church in this new dispensation. Three things we're looking at. Number one, Christ's purpose for his purchased purified church. Christ's purpose for his purchased purified church. Point number two, Christ's precepts for his precious priestly church. Christ's precepts for his precious priestly church. Point number three, Christ's power through his pressing, prevailing church. The church that presses on, the minister, 
the presses on, pressing on to the high calling of God upon your life, Christ's power through his pressing, prevailing church. Number one, what's number one? Christ's purpose for his purchased, purified church. We need to know that the church is purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed, look at this, the church, the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood, is the purchased church. He bought us, he redeemed us, he paid the price, and he paid the price with his own blood, the purchased church. When we say church, what does that mean? Acts chapter 15, reading from verse 14. Acts chapter 15, verse 14. It says, Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, look at this, to take out, to take out of them a people for his name. That's the church. You've heard this before. In the Greek, the word is ecclesia. And it means the assembly of called out people. The congregation of called out people. The people who are in the world, they were in darkness, they were in wickedness, they were in evil. And then the message of the gospel called them out. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And they responded. And because they responded, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, they were washed, they were cleansed, they were forgiven, their lives were transformed. And God, in that verse 14, latter part of verse 14, to take out of them a people for himself, for his name. Actually, that's similar to what happened to the children of Israel. They were in Egypt. And then the Lord called them out. Exodus chapter 3. That's what the Lord is sending us to do when it says building the church. It's not just uh, preaching to them and leaving them where they are. It's to call them out of darkness, call them out of sin, call them out of evil, call them out of Satan worship, call them out of idolatry, call them out of anything, everything contrary to the will of God. I said it's similar to what God did for the children of Israel, Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, reading from verse 10, remember, to take out a people for his name, take them out, out. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel. Tell me what follows out of Egypt. Notice that. Mark that in your Bible. The children of Israel, they were with the people, the Egyptians, living like them. They were serving them, worshiping their idols. And then God said, you are my people. Let my people go. And then God sent Moses and he got them out of Egypt. Mark those words out of Look at the interpretation of that in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, and I'm reading here from verse 38, called out, bring them out, sever them, separate them, take them out of Egypt. And when they were taken out, 
and they were going to the promised land. Look at what the Lord called them now in chapter 7 of Acts, verse 38. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. This is he, talking about Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness. The church in the wilderness. You know those people, as they were taken out, as they were called out, then they became the church in the wilderness. That's what the Lord is telling you and telling me as a census force, as a census out, and we're bringing the people unto God out of their sin, out of the captivity of Satan, out of all the pollutions of society, and they're called out. They're converted. They become children of God. And so they now become the church, the church. Go back to the Old Testament, Leviticus, and see what the church is. It says the church in the wilderness because they were brought out. In Leviticus chapter 20, Leviticus chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 26, the plan of God, the purpose of God for the people he refers to as the church. It says, and ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have severed you. I have separated you. I have taken you out. I have severed you from all the people that you shall be mine. So the church belongs to God. It belongs to God because they are purchased, they are bought with a price. And so as we reach out and we say we're building the church with Christ, we're telling those sinners to come out of their sin. Idolaters to come out of their idol worship. And um, all those people that do evil to come out of their wickedness. And when they turn, when they repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and their sins are wiped away and washed away and the Spirit of God bears witness in their heart that they are now saved, they are forgiven, they are converted and there is transformation of life, they are separated from the world, they become the people of God, the church of God, the called out people. Now the purpose, knowing what the church is, Understanding what the church is, what are we to do? The church now towards the world in cooperation, in unity with Christ to build his church. Number one, evangelize. That's the purpose. And that's why you are here tonight. You are a candidate for progress. A candidate to serve the Lord. You will serve the Lord more. I said you will serve the Lord more and this work of the Lord will prosper in your hands in Jesus name number one evangelize number two edify edify where to evangelize where to edify number three equip where to equip number one evangelize all sinners in every community evangelize all sinners in every community look at this this is the commission the great commission and this is the work he has given you an eye to do matthew chapter 28 i'm reading from verse 18 matthew chapter 28 we're reading from verse 18 here he tells us pointedly pungently and he tells us purposefully and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Think about that. In heaven, all power is given to Christ. Here on earth, anywhere you are on earth, the power, all power is given unto Christ. And as you go, any field where you find yourself, any community where you find yourself, remember Christ with all power is abiding with you there. You will not fail. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father 
and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. How often will he be with you? I said, how often will he be with you? Any time, any time as you are going out, remember that when you see those people, there's a greater power on your side. There's a greater presence on your side. And it says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, to the end of the age. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 16, evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. That's the purpose why Christ has, you know, brought us together as servants of God, as soul winners, as leaders in his church. He tells us in Mark chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Evangelize all sinners in every community. And then it says in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Your, uh, your contacts, they will believe. They'll be baptized. They'll be saved in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, here we're reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 47. It tells us in verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's the calling he has given us. That's the commission he has given us. That we preach the gospel. We evangelize all sinners in every community. Number two, edify, edify, edify all saints in every congregation. Edify all saints in every congregation. That's our calling. We're outside there in the world and we're converting the world unto Christ. And then we're coming to the church and we're building up. And we're edifying. And we're transforming. And we're changing. And we're encouraging. And we're strengthening the people, the saints of God in the church. Edifying all saints in every congregation ephesians chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 11. ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers why for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. You see that? The edifying of the body of Christ. Whatever area of work you're involved in, you're praying, you're singing, you're moderating, you're teaching, you're pastoring, you're a woman leader, you're a youth leader, you're a campus a church leader, you're an adult church leader, you're the children church, anything you're doing, it is to edify the saints of God in every congregation. First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as she has zealous of spiritual gifts seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church anytime you have opportunity inside the church among the people of god to do anything it may be for a short time it may be for a longer time it may be for a day it may be on a regular basis what do you do you say how can i build up how can I encourage? How can I challenge? How can I strengthen the church? Because we're to edify the saints, all saints, in every congregation. Second Corinthians chapter 12. In Second Corinthians chapter 12, we're looking at verse 19. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves. You know, there are some ministers, they are excuse makers. They do a shoddy work. They do a work that doesn't edify, doesn't build anybody up. They come in to teach the people of God. They forget that these people of God were teaching. They have been hearing the word of God for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years, for 30 years. They forget that all the passages they might be reading, that the majority of the people of God, they've read those passages before. And they do not do their thorough homework. And they come and then they say something superficially that the people are sitting down there and saying, I didn't get anything. I didn't benefit. Yes, I hear words. I hear the reading of the scriptures. I didn't have proper interpretation. And I didn't have the application of the words of God. We must not give excuse. We must not be excuse makers. Sometimes, you know, some people come and they minister to us in one way or the other. And any friend will tell them outside after we finish that you didn't give your best. I've listened to you before. That wasn't your best. I'm not just talking of preachers. I'm talking of all of us that are ministering one way or the other. And a fellow will say, well, give an excuse. But you know, if you're going to edify the body of Christ, no excuse making. And from today, you'll not be an excuse maker. I'm talking to my people. I said, you'll not be an excuse maker. Look at that verse 19 again. Think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ. But we do. How many things do we do? I said how many things? We do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For your edifying. You think about it and you think of the ministry that God has given you to minister to the church, to edify. Number one, evangelize. Number two, edify. Number three, equip all servants for the essential commission. Equip. That means to train, that means to develop, equip all servants for essential commission. Second Timothy chapter 2. In Second Timothy chapter 2, we're reading from verse 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 2. Here it tells us how to equip, how to train. How to develop others and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also equip others commit that word to other people who shall be able to train and to teach others also philippians chapter 4 verse 9 in philippians chapter 4 verse 9 those things which she have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the god of peace shall be with you in colossians chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 Verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring. You will not only labor when it's convenient. When it's not convenient, you pull up yourself, you are going to labor. Always laboring, fervently. You will not labor sluggishly carelessly, half-heartedly. I'm tired today. I pray I will never be tired any day. I said, I will never be tired any day. The work of God is there, and you are there, and you deserve to be served. We're going to keep on serving you fervently in Jesus' name. It says, laboring fervently for you, 
in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Look at verse 17 and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. You'll fulfill your ministry. I said you will fulfill your ministry. No, I used to think that, you know, as loud as your amen is, so will the fulfillment be upon your life. Yeah. We come to point number two now. Point number two, Christ's precepts for his precious priestly church. Christ's precepts for his precious priestly church. We're coming to... Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, we can see how the Lord addressed the church. And he said to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pagamos, the church in Tatira, the church in Sardis, and the church in Philadelphia, and the church in Sardis, right. And in the things he wrote to the church, he sent to the church, he shows us the precepts, number one, of the precepts, dedicate your life to preach the whole truth. Dedicate your life, that's what he expects, dedicate your life to preach the whole truth. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, and has tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has born, and then has uh, also your patience, and then he goes on to say, For my name's sake. As thou labored and hast not fainted. And from that, the Lord appreciated what he did. And the Lord is calling us, number one, dedicate your life to preach the whole truth. Come, come to the altar and lay your life as if you could handle your life. And then it's tangible in your hand and you lay it on the altar and you say, Lord, this single life will do just one thing. I will spend this life to serve you. You will serve the Lord. Number two, you also demonstrate the grace of patience and perseverance. You see, if you're running a race, in the middle of the race, you might be tired. You're not stone. Even uh, lions get tired that's what they rest and sleep sometimes you may get tired but in the midst of the tiredness you'll pray that the dew of heaven will fall upon your tired soul revive you and strengthen you so that you rise up again and you pursue and you do that perseveringly and you do that patiently day after day look at that verse 3 again it says and has born and has patience and for my name's sake has labored you'll keep on laboring and has not fainted number two demonstrate the grace of patience and perseverance number three devote yourself to love truly and to love fully let there be no rival between God and anybody. Let it be known that there goes a man that loves God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his mind. There goes a woman that loves God with all her soul, all her mind, and all her strength. You devote yourself to love God truly and to love God fully. Look at verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, 
because thou hast left thy first love. He wants that first love. He wants that burning love. He wants that flowing affection. He wants that overflowing commitment unto him and to his work so that he will say, you are keeping that first love the fervency of the love, the passion of the love, and then the depths of the love for the Lord. You devote yourself to love truly and love fully. Number four, you dissociate yourself from compromisers and corruptors. You dissociate yourself. Once you see, that means that your friendship is conditioned on loving God and serving God. You've been, you know, kind of associating with somebody and he believes in God. He believes in the word of God. All of a sudden, something happened that his heart is no more with God. His mind is no more with God. The way he lives now is a, is a compromiser, is a corrupter. And you talk to him and you pray for him and you do everything you can do to jolt him and to shake him a little and to say this is not you and this is not what you ought to be and he says well this is what i want to be now this is what i want to do now if you want to be my friend be my friend i'm not going to change you dissociate yourself from anyone who is a compromiser and a corrupter you will not say well i know he's gone the wrong way i know he's doing evil but you know i just like him it's just my friend uh -uh. you cannot do that and that's what the lord said look at verse six in verse six it says but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the nicolaitans which also i hate you must hate evil you dissociate yourself from corruptors and from uh, compromisers and you disallow from your pulpit anyone that is going to mislead the congregation we're looking at number what number now number five you deny self and embrace the cross of persecution you deny self and embrace the cross of persecution even though it might be very difficult to do it fearlessly and you do it faithfully look at chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 9 revelation chapter 2 verse 9 and unto the angel of the church in smyrna right it says these things says the first and the last which was dead and is alive i know thy works and thy tribulation and thy poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogues of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. You see, success sometimes will bring suffering, or in persecution, or bring the cross, or bring difficulty. But thank God you are ready. I say, thank God you are ready. Because all the problems of this life, they are nothing in comparison with the glory that shall come upon us. Number six, dare to plant a church. Dare to pastor a church, a strong church, in the most difficult place. Dare to plant a church. If they say, that's a difficult terrain. That's a difficult place. Those people there, they never hear. Evangelists don't succeed there. Take that as a challenge. Pray and fast. Have the unction of the Holy Ghost upon you afresh. Have the power and the courage of the Almighty in your heart once again. And let the spirit of the conqueror and the spirit of Caleb come upon you and say, Give me this mountain. You will not run away from difficulty. I said you will not run away from challenges. 
and you are going to do the work of God faithfully, you dare to plant the church and you dare to pastor a strong church in the most difficult place. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's siege is. And yet it says, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days whereon Antipas was my faithful matter. And then it goes on to say, who oh, was slain among you where Satan dwelleth, even though the challenges are there, you'll keep on standing. Am I talking to somebody there today? And you will stand faithfully to the end in Jesus' name. Number seven, determine never to overlook sin in anyone in the church. Determine never to overlook sin in anyone in the church. You know, sometimes uh, we leaders, we're just uh, human beings like other people. The only difference is we have the Spirit of God abiding within us. The only difference is we have the Word abiding within us. The only difference is we have the roadmap and we have the plan of action and we have the strategy of what the Lord has commanded us to do. And when you see sin in anyone, you know, sometimes you say, but you know about this now, how could this happen? How could so and so do this? And you happen to be the pastor, you happen to be the leader and you have to take action. You will fight against sin. I said they will fight against him. But you know, there are people who are like jellyfish. They don't have any backbone. They cannot stand. And when they see sin, they will turn their face to the other side. I see. I don't see. And if somebody reports to them and said, Sir, pastor, a woman leader, so and so, is living in open sin, scandal. This is terrible. It's okay. You've done your part. You've told me, forget about it. Don't talk to any other person. You've told me, just, just be praying for them. You know, everybody has a boat. Everybody has a, a challenge. And since you've told me, just overlook it. No. But you know, such people, leaders like that, if it is somebody who is not close to them, if it is somebody who is not, uh, you know, very active and all that, that they, you know, appreciate, they said, are you sure that he did that? I'll get him immediately. Come on, come on here. I hear that this, this and this. Is it true? Uh, I'm sorry. Get out of that place. You cannot do that. When it is somebody not familiar with them, the test of real character is that even if somebody is close to you and you see he's not living right, you will do the same thing. You will rebuke sin. You will chastise sin. And you make them to repent and call upon the Lord. I pray you will not be a compromiser. That amen is not good enough. Determine never to overlook sin in anyone in the church. Look at chapter 2, verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19, it says, I know thy works and thy charity and thy service and thy faith and thy patience and thy works and the last of them more than the first. Notwithstanding in verse 20, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest, thou allowest, thou permittest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And the pastor of that church just, just left it like that. I don't want any trouble. What if the judges in our nation, when they hear about, you know, cases of people they know, I don't want any trouble. 
I know their mother. I know their father. I don't want to be involved in this. A church cannot do that. And what if a teacher in a school will say, this paper is bad. This result is going to be woeful. But I can't mark this paper. I can't give this a failure because I know the parents. And because this one is, you know, very close to me. You can't do that. The same thing with the pastor. You will make up your mind and you will determine that you'll never overlook any sin in anyone in the church. Number eight. You direct your efforts to convert sinners and backsliders in the church. There are sinners in the church, sinful members. There are backsliders in the church, backsliding members. And you direct your efforts to waking them up, confronting them, convicting them, compelling them to go back to Calvary and to seek the face of the Lord and be saved. Look at chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, And unto the angel of the church it Sardis right. This thing says he, that has the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, tell me the rest, and I dead, be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what time I come, what hour I come unto thee. We must direct our efforts to make sure that sinners in the church, backsliders church, will reach out to them. Number nine, discern open doors of opportunity in ministry. Open doors, opportunities for you to take the gospel to your community. Open doors for you to reach co workers in your office. Open doors for you to reach those in the marketplace. Open doors for you to reach those who are sick and those who are tormented and bring the gospel to them. Recognize those open doors, discern them, and then bring the gospel appropriately. Chapter 3, verse 7. In chapter 3, verse 7, it says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? The thing says he that is holy and he that is true he that has the key of david and he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth i know thy works behold i have set before thee an open door i have set before thee an open door from this day, you are going to discover new opportunities to serve the Lord. New opportunities to lead the fallen. New opportunities to raise those who, are, those who have gone down. He has set before you an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Number 10, depend on Christ's power and promises, on failing promises. Depend on Christ's power and on failing promises. Verse 10, because thou hast kept the watch of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation. The Lord will keep you. I said the Lord will keep you. You'll be going from strength to strength in Jesus' name. 
And then he goes on to say, this sin will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the face of the earth. But he has given you assurance, it will preserve you and protect you. Number 11, declare and defend the truth, whatever the cost. The people who are faithful when it's easy. There are people who stand by the word when the road is smooth. There are people who will challenge any situation, provided many people around them are cheering them and congratulating them. But when the road is rough, when the situation is tough, they cannot declare and they cannot defend the truth. But the Lord is calling upon us, he says, if you're going to build with him, that you will declare the truth, you will defend the truth, whatever the cost may be. Chapter 3 of Revelation, and I'm reading from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You have a crown. I said you have a crown. And nobody will take your crown in Jesus' name. Number 12, deal with lukewarmness in yourself and in the church. Deal with lukewarmness. The people who are lukewarm, indifferent, lethargic, nonchalant, careless, carefree. And the fire of revival is burning. And everybody is saying, praise the Lord, it's a new day. Praise the Lord, it's a new dawn. Praise the Lord, it's a new dispensation. And everybody is speaking up, and everybody is, uh, you know, running. You know, they're still like they were. As they were months ago, years ago, that's the way they still are now. Let's come to the Bible study. I don't choose to go to the Bible study, but my friend, it's a new day. Let's go to Thursday Revival Hour, Bagada. Power as of old has come again. Revival as of old has come again. Energy, divine energy from heaven has come again. And there are people that are dragging. There are people like, you know, they're still lethargic and lukewarm. I pray that that, all, that that lethargy and that lukewarmness will get out of every life in Jesus' name. I will not be lukewarm. Look up here, look up here. Do you see somebody here that looks like he's lukewarm? It's lethargic. He doesn't know what is going to happen on Thursday. I know what's going to happen to you on Thursday when you come. I said I know what's going to happen to you on Thursday when you come. That mountain will roll away. That impossibility will be possible. That thing that they said, you know, we have prayed, we have fasted, we have done this, we have done that, and nothing happened. Come on, Thursday, something is going to happen. We must deal with lukewarmness and deal with lethargy anywhere we find it. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, I know thy words, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that what cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. And it says, because thou sayest, I am rich, I'm all right because thou sayest I'm increased with goods because thou sayest I have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and naked and blind I counsel thee I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire fire will come in your soul fervency will come in your life here is what the Lord is telling us. The Lord is telling us that if we're going to build with him, we deal with lukewarmness, and in your life something great will happen in Jesus' name. Point number three, now I'm coming to Christ's power through his pressing, prevailing people. Christ's power through a suppressing, prevailing church. 
We're looking at Matthew chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. It says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. What are you there? The keys of the kingdom. And whoever has the key has the final say. You know, the door is locked, and we're waiting. And then we're saying, what is the man with the key? What is the man with the key? And the people of the world are waiting. They'll be looking for somebody. They'll be looking for the man that has the key. They'll be looking for the woman that has the key. And I can tell you, the key is coming in your heart today. The key of power. The key of anointing and the key of unction and the key that will open you will open every door before you in jesus name all those difficulties and all those things that are bound and tied down the key is coming in your hand and as you have the key you are going to go out into the world and every every person that says locked in a prison you are going to open the door for them Everyone that is locked in sickness, you are going to open the door for them. Anyone that is locked in darkness, you are going to open the door for them. You will set captives free. You will deliver the oppressed. And great things will happen through you in Jesus' name. Because it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever, somebody help me shout whatsoever. And this is talking about you. I said he's talking about you. Uh, you know, you know, sometimes when you are young and then you're looking at, you know, adult and the adult is walking or the adult is running or the adult is talking or the adult is doing something. And then you say, I wish I could grow up. I wish I could become like an adult. And then this was 20 years ago. 25 years ago and now look at you what you said i wish i could i wish i would now by the grace of god you are able i said you are able and the same thing spiritually when you are young spiritually i wish i could do that i wish i could say that the time has come for you to grow up because now you have the key I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loose in heaven did I hear an amen, amen. who is the candidate that will take the key and then as you take that key you hold it in your hand you hold it in your heart you know when god called moses he gave him the key there was a rod in his hand and with that rod he appeared before pharaoh and he overcame with that rod he appeared before the red sea and overcame with that rod he stood before the mountain and water came out that was his own key that was his own key and your own key the name of jesus are you there the name of Jesus and whatsoever, whatsoever ye shall ask in that name, I will give it unto you. Look at our senior brother now as he has a key in his hand and he's going and then he saw this lame man and he said, look on us. Somebody who has the key can talk confidently. As you go out now, you have the key, you are going to talk confidently. And then he was looking at them, hoping to receive something. And he says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, what I have. He knew he had something. Thank God tonight I have something. I said, thank God tonight I have something. I have the key. I said, I have the key. Where are you? I said, I have the key. What I have it is the name. It said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk and he rose up and he rose up you are rising up you are rising up are you sitting down you are rising up have the key tonight have the key tonight have the key tonight have the key tonight have the power of the lord jesus in your life have the power of the lord jesus and the power of the holy ghost i give unto you the key the keys of the kingdom the keys of the kingdom and whatsoever and whatsoever and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven you are the candidate receive it receive it receive it 
receive it your habit tonight go forth and go and do exploits for the lord